So we are here today on April 16th, 2019 at Mitchell Hamlin School of Law in St. Paul. I'm Ann Jurgens, a professor here since 1984. And I'm interviewing Nadine Strassen for the Women in Legal Education section Oral History Project. Um, she's given a wonderful speech today and spoken with students and now is sitting down with me. I'm going to start first by asking Nadine to tell us all of her roles in her work life. Right now, my full-time profession is as a professor of law at New York Law School, where I'm proud to hold the title of the John Marshall Harlan II Chair. I also am very active in human rights organizations, uh, including the ACLU, the American Civil Liberties Union, of which I was national president for almost 18 years. I'm now on the National Advisory Council of the ACLU, and I also serve on the national advisory boards of a couple other human rights organizations, including FIRE, the Foundation for Individual Rights in Education, EPIC, the Electronic Privacy Information Center, and Heterodox Academy. Let's begin with where you were born and where you grew up. I was born in Jersey City, New Jersey. My parents then lived not too far away in, uh, in wow, in West New York, New Jersey. I'm almost forgetting because I was extremely young when they moved to Dumont, New Jersey, which is the first house that I remember. And a few years later to Nutley, New Jersey, where I began my educational career at the uh, at Washington Elementary School. Tell me about your family a bit, and then also the community that you spent most of your childhood in. I, my father was transferred when I was eight years old from uh, New York. He was working in New York City to a job in Minneapolis. I was eight years old at the time, so from third grade through graduating high school, I lived and was a student in Hopkins, a suburb of Minneapolis, so I considered that my childhood and, and teenage home. My family consisted of a mother whose maiden name was Sylvia Simicic. Her father was a, an immigrant to the United States from what is now Croatia. At the time, it was under the jurisdiction of the Italian government. He was a very ferocious Marxist adamant. Uh, in his political beliefs and in his criticism of capitalism. He was an adamant opponent of World War I and a conscientious objector during World War I, which is interesting because uh, years later I learned that the ACLU, which I was so proud to head for so many years, actually was formed in large part to defend the civil liberties of anti-war protesters in the World War I era. So my grandfather could well have been one of our clients. A story that I've often told that I was uh, raised with is that he was actually criminally prosecuted for exercising what we would now consider to be his free speech rights to protest the war. But of course, the Supreme Court had not yet meaningfully enforced the First Amendment freedom of speech. So at least he wasn't imprisoned as thousands of peaceful opponents to the war were. Uh, but his sentence was to stand outside the Hudson County Courthouse in Hudson County, New Jersey, um, with his hands and feet splayed up against the courthouse walls so that passers-by could spit on him. His wife was uh, the daughter of Italian immigrants, extremely poor from uh, near Naples. And my grandmother always told me about how poor they were, that they only had dirt floors and 
um, very, very little food, so they were economic immigrants to the United States. And my mother was raised in poverty. I, w I was raised in on stories of the Great Depression and how uh, her father lost his job, her mother lost her job, the family was so poor that social services came to take the four children away from my grandparents. I didn't even know that was an option. You know, rather than providing food, um, they took the kids away and my grandfather protested and I'll never forget his telling me how he howled like an animal to get his children back. On my father's side, he was born in Berlin in 1922 as the son of a um, successful um, industrial family. I mean, not, not huge, but they had a small uh, successful family pharmaceutical business. My grandfather was very well educated. He had gone to Heidelberg University. My grandmother, who was Jewish, um, was also very well educated and very cultured. So they had a wonderful home. My father was uh, went to a very uh, fine gymnasium, was educated, you know, eight years of Latin and eight years of Greek and English and, 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 and you know, steeped in culture and the arts and, you know, wonderful family vacations and skiing in Switzerland. But all of that came to a crashing halt with the rise of Hitler and my father and his brothers had not actually been raised as Jews. My grandmother's family had converted several generations earlier and my father and his brothers were confirmed in the Lutheran church. In fact, uh, the famous pastor Niemöller actually confirmed my father. He's the one who wrote that famous poem about first they came for it, so and so and, and you know and then by the time they came for me there was nobody left. Um, so the, I, my father tells the story and my uncles as well that they didn't even know about their Jewish background until they were pulled out of school for the crime of being half Jewish. My father had always opposed Hitler even as a, as a preteen adolescent um, and he ended up being sent to the Buchenwald forced labor camp where he fortunately was not immediately slated for assassination because he was young enough and healthy enough at the time he went in that the Nazis could use him for backbreaking labor. He got extremely ill and almost died of pleurisy. Moreover, he was scheduled to be sterilized and literally one day before he would have been sterilized, Buchenwald and my father were liberated by the U.S. military. He was then, um, he volunteered for, uh, to serve with the um, U.S. Armed Forces because of his English capability and his um, knowledgeability. He went to work for what was the predecessor of the CIA to help them track down Nazis and um, after a while, he was given an opportunity to go to the United States by, he was brought over by the Joint Distribution uh, Committee, a Jewish organization. And I didn't learn until much later that because of all the chaos in post-war Germany, he had to leave the country without ever seeing his parents or his brothers. One of his, his second oldest brother was also in the Buchenwald camp. The two youngest ones managed to hide out the war along with their Jewish mother um, in Berlin. But that was, you know, very, very sad for him. He was extremely close to his family. But given the opportunity to escape um, a country that had been so brutal to him and to so many others, and he had always venerated the United States, he seized that opportunity. Wow. I can see this the fact that you know all this grandparent history is wonderful because many people, and parent, this was your father you were just talking about. Um, do you have any siblings? I have one brother who is about a year and three months younger than yeah. I am. Yep. And tell me about your early, we're going to come back to you after that great family background. Tell me about your early education years through high school. Did you like school? Uh, what strikes you as memorable about it? 
I really loved school. I began, I went all the way through public schools, uh, starting in Nutley, New Jersey, then continuing in Hopkins, Minnesota. And I am, and then I ended up going to Harvard College and Harvard Law School, where I was studying with people who had gone to the fanciest public schools and the wealthiest suburbs in, bought outside of Boston and New York and so forth, and people who had gone to the fanciest prep schools, private schools, and I really held my own, which I give credit to my incredibly dedicated teacher all throughout both school systems. I still remember vividly uh, key teachers. My first grade teacher at, um, at Washington Elementary School in Nutley, New Jersey, who was so inspiring and helping me develop my love of reading, which I had learned to read somehow before I went to school, and I always was a passionate, what we called in those days, bookworm. Uh, and then in Minnesota, I had fabulous teachers in grade school and in what we then called junior high school and also senior high school. I'd say the single most important educational experience for me, if I had to choose, was being an active member of the debate team at what was then Hopkins High School, and later subdivided into two high schools, and I understand it's now back to one. Mm -hmm. But we had an incredibly dedicated uh, lead coach named Charles Carrison, who, was, who clearly could have taught, and I think later did go on to teach at the University of Minnesota, but really believed that he had a calling, as, as all of my teachers did. Um, they all had advanced degrees, and they were all incredibly bright and well-read, but I understand why they felt that they could make, and they did, make much more of a difference in lives and the future of these young people at that critical stage. And we had so many dedicated other teachers who would now, I look back in retrospect, and I think, my goodness, I was complaining about having to get up at five in the morning in the dead of winter to drive in the dark to some debate tournament somewhere in Minnesota or maybe even Iowa or Wisconsin. And you would have these on Saturdays and Sundays. This is how these teachers who had their own young children at the time would be, you know, just do that. And they would be judging the tournaments while we were competing in them and so generously giving of their time after school. Um, through that, I really developed my analytical and critical um, thinking skills, my writing skills, certainly my oral articulation skills, and I developed my interest in law that way because uh, one year, one of the, the, the national debate topic, which was the one that we would always focus on, uh, was a legal subject, and I remember taking the public bus from Hopkins down to the University of Minnesota Law Library doing research there and thinking, this is absolutely fascinating. And I will tell this story on myself because I am so in awe of women I read about from the 18th century or even earlier who decided that they would be lawyers when they had absolutely no role models and no support at all. I was not that kind of a pioneer. I had never seen or heard of a woman lawyer. I actually did not even know any lawyers at all growing up, but I became fascinated with the law, and so I said to my male debate partners, I was the only female on the team, I said, you ought to go to law school. This is so fascinating, and it never occurred to me that that would be a possibility for me. Uh, and then I remember my mother, who was always a very, you know, um, uh, she missed New York, where she had grown up, uh, very much. She was always homesick for New York. So one of the things she did to try to salve her homesickness was to subscribe to the Sunday New York Times. And I would read that as a kid. And I remember reading about how Harvard Law School had founded, if not the first, certainly one of the first student legal aid bureaus in the country. And I thought, oh, that's fantastic because you can hone your legal skills and you can help represent people who can't afford a lawyer. So I said to my male debate partners, you ought to go to Harvard <laughs> Law School and you ought to join the Legal Aid Bureau. And again, little did it occur to me that I could do that. Then I did go off to Harvard College and I immediately became involved and then, then burgeoning 
women's movement and reproductive freedom movement, I met not only lawyers, but women lawyers, and a big light bulb went off in my head, oh, I can go to Harvard Law School and I can uh, join the Legal Aid Bureau, which I'm happy to say I did. And tell me, what year did you graduate from high school and did you always know you were going to go to college? Was that taken for granted in your family or was that a more conscious decision? I graduated from high school in 1968 and I am so fortunate that I had parents for whom education was paramount. And these were two people who were deprived of educational opportunities themselves. My father was yanked out of uh, his gymnasium in Germany because he was a half Jew. He would have gone to college, you know, if it had not been for Hitler, a big exception. Uh, when he came to this country as a refugee, to his enormous credit, he did what many refugees did. He worked full time during the day and put himself through what was then CCNY, City College of New York at night. Uh, it was low tuition, but still it was a, a struggle and he was did not have the luxury of studying what he wanted to study. My father always had wanted to be a doctor. He continued to want to do that even after he retired. You know, I said, Dad, it's not too late. You can become a paramedic or something in the medical field. But he got a degree in chemistry. Um, he had been studying chemistry and thought that it would be pre-med. But so he could go into business and earn money. He was sending money back to his family in Germany because they had nothing. And so the economic pressures really deprived him of the luxury of studying where his heart was. My mother was not allowed to go to college by her father, who for all of his Marxist ideology, uh, had the most benighted views on gender issues. And I was always very angry at him for that um, because I saw how he stifled the opportunities, both for my grandmother and for my mother. Um, I, th I think it's fair to say he was a misogynist. And, and, and it's true, my mother could have tried to defy him, but I'm not going to blame her. For, I mean, I'm saying on myself, I would not have gone to law school on my own unless I had some support. I certainly could not have gone to college without the enormous support and encouragement, financial and intangible, of my family. So her father said to her, no, you're going to go to secretarial school. And that's what she did. And, um, you know, the good thing that came out of that was in that job, she met my father. Many, many years later, when my brother and I were old enough that we really didn't need much attention, uh, and the women's movement had come to the fore, my mother had, was always interested in feminism and Planned Parenthood, and when the National Organization for Women was founded, she immediately became a member. I remember seeing her, you know, in those days you had to send a check by mail. I remember um, seeing her check and her envelope, and um, she tried to then go back into the workforce to work again as a secretary, and um, she got a job. Uh, but she just couldn't handle it. The transition was just much, much, much too hard, and she had lost so much self-confidence, and it was really sad to see that. So um, that my parents gave me the greatest luxury that they had been deprived of because of discrimination and stereotypes. My father, because he was Jewish, my mother, because she was female. And I'm very happy now that I've saved some money. I recently endowed a uh, scholarship at New York Law School named after both of my parents because New York Law School also affords opportunities for people who are new immigrants who are the first generation in their family even to go to college let alone law school so it's a door opener as my parents were door openers for me and I'm sorry that nobody opened the door for them. How did you decide to go to Radcliffe College at Harvard University. Did and did you have any women professors? I was there the year after you. <laughs> I graduated from high school in 1969, and I was quite shocked at the four to one ratio of male students to female students, and the basically 100 percent male faculty. I believe Emily Vermeul inherited her husband's archaeology chair. When I went to Harvard College and Harvard Law School from 1968 through 1975, I had a grand total of 
one female instructor in that entire seven year period. Um, Harvard College uh, at the time had, a, there was a four to one ratio of males to females. Harvard and Radcliffe were integrated completely in terms of courses. So you would have, women had a Harvard education, but at that time there was a separate admission process and there were 1,200 men admitted for 300 women, which is why uh, we women were even more excellent than the men. <laughs> and then Harvard Law School did not have a fixed ratio, but the proportion was about 10 to one at the time that, that I went there uh, with very huge classes. So women were a small minority among the student body. And I really didn't, I had female role models, but they were mostly through my activism in the larger community, including especially in the women's rights and reproductive freedom movements. I had always wanted to go to what I thought was the best university in a major city. Having grown up in Minneapolis with a mother who was homesick for New York, who regularly brought me to New York to my great delight to spend time with her parents there, I loved the city and I had assumed that at the earliest opportunity I would come to college in uh, New York. So I looked at Columbia University and to my horror, I learned that uh, unlike Harvard and Radcliffe, Columbia and Barnard were completely separate. I think it was possible to take a course or two if you were a woman at Columbia, but it was the, the norm would be that you would be operating in an all-female environment. And I, I did not want that. Uh, plus, I, the campus was a bit too urban for me, which is ironic because I've now spent my entire adult life living, you know, in that exact same location because my husband is a Columbia professor. Now, by my New York standards, it seems like a beautiful campus and, uh, you know, very green compared to the rest of New York. <laughs> uh, but I really loved the Boston and Cambridge area. It seemed to me to be the right combination of a large enough city, but not so overwhelming and not so urban as, as New York. And I loved the fact that my classes were co-ed and that I would have a complete opportunity. I thought it would be a complete opportunity to pursue the same education that men could. Um, there was one major exception, which was I could not pursue my uh, passion for debate because it turned out there still were what they called parietal rules. There were gender segregated housing. And the parietal rules said that women could not be in men's um, residential quarters after a certain fairly early hour and vice versa. Well, guess what? The Harvard debate team had its practices and its meetings in one of the male houses, so-called houses, and because of parietal rules, it was impossible for women to participate. So as a result of gender discrimination, I, I gave up. I could not pursue college debate. When you went to law school, did you have an idea of what you wanted to do afterwards? I always had a passion for justice. So I knew that I would pursue um, civil liberties, civil rights, uh, and I was very much following the civil rights movement when I was a kid. Uh, just at, felt absolutely passionate about racial justice and uh, obviously about women's rights. When I moved to Boston, there was actually a prosecution going on of a doctor who turned out to be African American was being prosecuted for having performed a therapeutic abortion on a woman and that was still a crime in Boston. And so that really galvanized me for uh, the reproductive freedom movement, which I had always supported. My mother, you know, not only was a charter member of NOW, she was very supportive of Planned Parenthood. She used, I mean, she was so ahead of her time in the causes that she supports. It's too bad she died before I became ACLU president. She would have been so, before I started law school for that matter, she would have been so proud. But she used to introduce my brother and me as her two planned children. <laughs> when you 
finished law school, I'm going to move on. I could ask you a lot more about your experience being one of a class of 10% women with was your one woman teacher in college or in law school? My one woman college uh, what teacher was in college. It was for a German language course. And she still is on the Harvard faculty. She went on to have a distinguished career there, and we are still in touch. I tell her what an important role model she was for me. And then when you graduated, what did you do next? Because you went straight through from college to law yes, school. Yes, I did. And yeah. um, partly for economic reasons, because I knew that law school tuition was getting higher and higher. And my father uh, decided that he did not want to foot the bill for law school. And to, anyway, to make a long story short, I felt pressure to, to go straight through. Um, and I knew that I wanted to... Um, have a diverse, uh, I, I, I didn't have enough of a specialized interest to be like a real estate lawyer or an estate lawyer. And so I went into litigation, which somebody once described to me as a dilettante's delight because you get to deal with different areas of law and different real world areas. I also knew that I wanted to combine private practice with public interest work. So uh, after grad, and I knew that I wanted to come back to Minnesota, for which I was very homesick after seven years in, in Boston. Um, I really wanted a smaller scale city and legal community to begin my career because I thought if I went to Wall Street or Washington, D.C., I would just be carrying somebody else's briefcases and um, doing document re review. Um, since I wasn't familiar with the Twin Cities legal scene, I decided to take a one-year judicial clerkship in Minnesota to give me some opportunity to explore the career options after that. So I clerked for a justice on the Minnesota Supreme Court, which was a wonderful experience. And uh, I already immediately began uh, doing volunteer work for the what was then called the Minnesota Civil Liberties Union. I decided to join a wonderful firm called Lindquist and Venom, uh, which has a very had a very strong tradition, I assume it still does, of public interest work and very, very supportive. They represented very interesting clients, so even their paid work made you feel like you were working for the public interest. I, uh, I know they represented the Minneapolis School Board uh, through struggles with desegregation and uh, the musicians of the Minnesota Orchestra. They did a lot of labor work, which was very appealing to me. But they were also very supportive of community engagement. And uh, so many of the lawyers at the firm were involved in a whole host of civic organizations. And I was able to, to do that. I was one of the most active lawyers at the firm, but I was also active not only in the Minnesota Civil Liberties Union, but also the DFL, the DFL Feminist Caucus, the Minnesota Women's Political Caucus. Um, there were some good government type organizations that I was involved in. It's just kind of amazing to me how much you could do at that time. The standard for lawyers was not working as crushing hours as I think has come to be the norm in the Twin Cities, and certainly that was the norm when I moved to New York three years later. Let me just pause for a moment on the Minnesota. How were there any women on the Supreme Court when you were there? Were no there? women on the Supreme Court? First, there were there was not a single other women woman Supreme Court clerk. I was the only one. And um, then the governor, and I'm so embarrassed that I'm going to forget his name, was Rudy Perpich. Rudy Perpich pledged that um, his first Supreme Court appointment would be a woman. I think he was taking a cue from Ronald Reagan, or was no, that was later. Ronald Reagan did the same thing, interestingly enough. So Rudy was ahead of, of him. Uh, and I was very active in the Women's Political Caucus and the DFL Feminist Caucus, and we were asked for recommendations for that um, 
position, and we, the Minnesota Women's Political Caucus, endorsed Rosalie Wall, whom I had had the pleasure of meeting when she was the only woman who argued before the Minnesota Supreme Court, and she did so repeatedly during the year that I was there as a clerk, and she made a very positive impression, and I uh, remember um, with great uh, fondness going to the celebration and when she was sworn in as the first female justice on the Minnesota Supreme Court. I still cherish a photograph of the two of us together. And then I was so delighted years later to see that Minnesota had, a, was it a majority? It yes. wasn't all women, right? But it was a majority of women. And then years later, I was so privileged to give the Rosalie Wall lecture for the Minnesota Women Lawyers Association. Yes, I, let me just say here, since this is for the women in legal education, Rosalie Wall was a clinical professor at Mitchell at the time that she was appointed, but she was working for the public defender and arguing cases, but also um, teaching you know, part of the time as a practitioner. And the Minnesota Women Political Caucus held Rudy Purpich to a promise he had made them. So it was the women political organizers that you mentioned that helped hold Rudy's feet to the fire. It's, it's a good story of uh, uh, political organizing. Um, where did you go? Tell us about then when you left Lindquist and left Minnesota, I take it. I decided that I had always had the goal of living in New York for a few years, partly fueled by my mother's great homesickness for New York and my periodic visits there as a kid. I just thought it was an amazing city. So I thought I would go to New York and live and practice there for a few years or until I got tired of it. That was 1978 and <laughs> I fairly soon realized that I was never going to get tired of New York. Uh, quite frankly, I was also very, in addition to wanting the experience of living in what I still think is the world's great megalopolis, I also wanted the experience of uh, quintessential New York law practice for this reason. I knew I didn't want to stay in that kind of practice, but I was very ambitious in terms of developing my lawyering skills to the maximum so I could put them to use in service of causes that I really believed in. And knowing from my college and law school classmates that uh, who were working in New York that they were working so many more hours than I was in Minneapolis, I thought, well, they're getting more experience. And so how do you become a better lawyer? You do it through more experience. And I also knew that uh, the best students in my law school class and in other law school classes had all flocked to these fancy Wall Street firms. So I thought you're going to be practicing with the best and the brightest. So I wanted to give myself that opportunity to see if I could become a better lawyer. And I also had one other curiosity to be quite uh, frank and candid. You know, I had not grown up in wealth, far to the contrary. And I thought, you know, it would be really interesting to see if making all that money, because by today's standards, it was not very much, but it was much more than I was making in Minnesota. And I was very curious to see if that would affect my life. And I'm very, very happy that I had that experience. I went to Sullivan and Cromwell, which I considered to be the quintessential Wall Street firm. Uh, and I did learn a lot there. But I think the most important lessons I learned are, number one, uh, that the lawyering there is not better than the lawyering I saw at Lindquist and Benham or before the Minnesota Supreme Court or uh, in the Twin Cities in general. And number two, that making all that much more money did not improve the quality of my life at all. It did not buy me anything I wanted. And conversely, uh, it was that the enormous hours were sapping me of uh, pleasure in life. And that was very dispiriting to, I worked so, so, so hard. And I do have to give credit to Sullivan and Cromwell. One of the reasons I went there was it had a reputation of thinly staffing cases. So I really had hands-on experience, responsibility for major, interesting, important cases, including courtroom experience. 
Um, but you would have to throw yourself into your cases and work 24-7. I remember my um, then boyfriend, subsequently husband, would come down to the office and sleep on the floor to keep me company as I was pulling all-nighters. And I would constantly say to myself, oh, when this case is over and I get some free time, then I'm going to go to the opera and I'm going to walk around the city and I'm going to hang out with friends, all the things that I had moved to New York to do. And the saddest thing was when the case would be over, I would find that I was so depleted of energy and also my interest in all of those other activities had waned as a result of being so invested um, just in my work at the firm. And I think psychologists would say you're going through some kind of cognitive dissonance experience, right? You persuade yourself that the only important thing in life is working as a lawyer. And so I decided I had to get liberate myself from that career path. And um, then I, in between, went to a smaller law firm. That was not the solution. And as a nice coincidence, a friend of my husband's from law school, we were in the same law school class, was teaching at NYU Law School, which had a, a wonderful clinical program headed up by the great, um, unique Anthony Amsterdam, who was really the founder of clinical legal education, first at Stanford and then at NYU. Um, my husband's friend said, you know, we've got an opening in the civil rights clinic at NYU Law School. I think Nadine would be perfect for that. And it was, it was just, it really was perfect because I got to pursue my passion for civil rights and my dream of um, passing on to students what I had not gotten in Harvard Law School because at the time there was only one clinic, it was heavily oversubscribed, so I never had the opportunity for clinical education myself, but I really believed in it, so it was wonderful to be able to provide that kind of educational opportunity to, to students. So you got into teaching almost it, it, just because the opportunity opened to you, it, was it intentional before that job I opening? I never would have thought of myself as uh, becoming a law professor. I really, quite frankly, detested law school. It, to me, was something I had to get through in order to pursue my dream of being a practicing lawyer advocating for liberty and justice for all. And in and, and saying that, I do have to say Harvard Law School then is very different from the way it is now. I mean, the demographics were very different. It was kind of a hostile environment, or certainly a lonely environment for female students without female faculty role models. Um, the faculty members were not engaged in practice at all, with very few exceptions. They kind of looked down their noses at practitioners, including even judges, and it was all like very theoretical. And I really wanted to, um, I wanted to me, so I didn't associate law school with anything that was important to me, being an activist. And I told my husband was very, very encouraging of me to pursue this opportunity. And of course, it was for a clinical position, so that was different right there. Uh, but it was, it was a position that expected you to do scholarship and classroom teaching. And I wasn't sure that I wanted to do that my, as an activist. And my husband persuaded me that it would be a perfect vehicle for activism. Not that I would be indoctrinating my students, that goes against all of my principles, but I did come to realize that, number one, educating people to be effective advocates is a wonderful form of activism. And number two, writing law review articles on issues about civil liberties and human rights it can be a very effective way of uh, pursuing persuading judges and other policymakers to adopt pro-human rights positions. How many years did you teach at NYU and then move, what was the move to New York Law School? I started teaching at NYU in 1984 and I stayed there until the fall of 1988 uh, when I was recruited by New York Law School. Uh, and at that point, I had 
written a number of law review articles. Uh, I started writing, doing legal scholarship immediately after I joined the NYU faculty, kind of as a coincidence, and I really have to give great credit to a faculty member there named Jim Jacobs, who was a criminologist as well as a, a legal scholar, and he knew that with the ACLU, I had worked on the ACLU policy on drunk driving roadblocks, a form of mass surveillance, and he said he was right, he already was in the process of writing an article that was already guaranteed publication in which he was making arguments that drunk driving roadblocks are not an effective way to deal with the drunk driving problem and he wanted me to join him as co-author to make the constitutional arguments against them and to me that was it came so naturally it was like writing a brief but here I was getting scholarly credit and so I just fell in love with doing legal research and writing law review articles and um, so I think that attracted New York Law School and a couple other law schools to uh, consider me for a non-clinical position. And uh, to my uh, surprise, I really, because I had not enjoyed being a student in non-clinical courses, I also thought, well, I could make it more interesting for my students. And uh, so I left at the opportunity to teach constitutional law specifically at New York Law School. And they were so kind after a one semester visit, um, they granted me tenure and full professorship. And I've been there ever since, very happily. Yes. Um, what gender-based obstacles and advantages would you say did you perceive throughout your career as a lawyer? I, I didn't want to put it only in terms of obstacles, but when you saw obstacles, what did you do about them? And then I think perhaps you'd have insight into some advantages. I think the major obstacle to me in the fact that women were such a tiny minority in the profession was that I did not have role models or mentors who were women. Now again, not everybody needs that, and I marvel at the women who were the trailblazers and who did it on their own, but uh, I know from how much I gained when I did have those role models, how much more I could have gained if I had had more of them. Uh, so for example, at I, I would definitely not have gone to law school had I not finally and it was late, but it was not too late had I not, when I was in college, finally met some women lawyers. Um, I could have gotten started earlier, I suppose, you know, done things that were relevant to prepare me for the study of law if I, that had been, and I, you know, somebody had been there to um, spur me in that direction earlier. And I should say that when I was in high school and junior high school, even though I had wonderful teachers, I also had some very discouraging ones, including women. And I look back at, at that with uh, 2020 hindsight, and I realized they were probably speaking out of their own frustration. I remember, for example, writing career, you know, we had assignments to write papers. What do you want to be when you grow up? And I was told by women teachers that I really admired who were clearly really intelligent. Nadine, I have to tell you, you're not going to be a foreign service officer. You're not going to be a foreign correspondent. These were the alternatives that I was interested in when I didn't realize I could be a lawyer. Um, and that was kind of sobering, and I respected them, so I, I took that seriously. Again, you know, the blame is on me. I shouldn't have allowed myself to be discouraged, but it would have been nice to have had encouragement rather than discouragement. When I went to law school, I know that absolutely a formative experience for me, there were no women professors that I had, uh, but I, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who was then the founding director of the Women's Rights Project at the ACLU, came to give a talk there, and that was definitely an incredibly important experience for me. I have no doubt that that um, pushed me in the direction of channeling my interest specifically toward the ACLU because I was involved in the whole panoply of human rights and civil rights and civil liberties, certainly including women's rights and reproductive 
Frida, and I was very struck by her explanation of why she chose the ACLU in particular. So um, it, it would have been nice to have had more people like that as, as, as mentors. I have to consider myself incredibly fortunate in this Me Too era that I was not subject to any kind of uh, sexual harassment, uh, let alone assault. I was treated with great respect and at, at every job that I had, and I'm grateful to uh, the men who gave me opportunities. and. Um, I think at Sullivan and Cromwell it probably was a little bit harder and I'm not sure what the factors were there. Uh, gender no doubt was one. You could count the number of female partners in Wall Street firms you know, on the fingers of, of one hand um, and that situation still has not improved as much as, as one would hope for a number of reasons. Um, and, and, and here's where I think I continue to see the major problem for women, or one of two major problems for women in our profession, as well as as many others, which is the, you know, the burden. I shouldn't say burden because it's an opportunity, and it's a pleasure, and it's a joy uh, to be the caretaker and the homemaker and the primary responsibility for raising children. But we just do not get enough support from employers or government. Uh, I don't think it's any coincidence that the, um, the women on the Supreme Court now are also two of them, the ones that are even younger than I am, are not married, no children. Um, and Ruth Bader Ginsburg had an amazingly unusual partnership with Marty, and they've talked about it often, but you know that it was not at all the norm to have a, a husband and father who was taking such an active role in raising the children and doing all the cooking and so forth. So that, and I, as I see the studies that are done by the ABA Commission on the Status of Women and, and, and other studies that women are dropping out of potential leadership positions in the profession, including partnerships at major law firms because of this, you know, so-called life-work balance. And there is no balance, you know, something has to, has to give. So that to me is, I was, I hate to say it's fortunate. I mean, it, 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 I never wanted children uh, for various reasons, so it worked out that I did not have to face that conundrum myself, but I, I certainly empathize with everybody who, who does face it, um, including those who are childless by choice but have caretaking responsibilities for other family members. Um, we have to do something about that. And I, I remember in the very first talk that I heard Ruth Bader Ginsburg give at Harvard Law School all those decades ago, that was always one of her crusades, that we women are never going to be completely free and equal until the uh, responsibilities, the domestic responsibilities, are equally shared. And it should be society's responsibility, not just the family. Um, the second um, um, major obstacle, and I can't say it's an obstacle, but it's a it's still a problem, is there is definitely uh, compensation discrimination. I will make no bones about it. I have suffered from it at every uh, stage in my career. And uh, there are many theories as to why this is. Perhaps one of the sort of blame the victim theories is that women are not strong enough advocates for ourselves, and I regret that. <laughs> but maybe better advocates for others. Exactly, yes. And do you think, so the trade-off, which would you rather be, a better advocate for yourself or a better advocate for others? We'll see. Um, Hopefully the two should go together. Correct. And as I always tell my students yes. when I'm trying to say, don't, um, you know, no false modesty in advocating for yourself. When you do so, you're advocating for the best advocate for your clients. Yes. Do you think there are any advantages to being female in our profession? I now think that there are advantages in terms of um, doing work for human rights and for justice causes because um, we are so understandably enmeshed in identity politics and I know that when I speak as a woman, 
uh, who has, of course, experienced discrimination for that reason. I think I speak with more persuasion and am perceived as being more empathetic by members of other minority groups. I don't think that should be the case, quite frankly. Um, some of the most committed, passionate, devoted advocates for justice and equal rights are white males. We were talking, for example, about our mutual, recently sadly departed colleague, Steve Elman. Uh, but for better or worse, it is seen as a as providing extra empathy, so, so that's positive. Uh, this will sound totally superficial, but it's something that Ruth Peter Ginsburg and I talked about, uh, including it re very recently in, in a public interview that she generously asked me to conduct of her fashion. We have more options. Even in the Supreme Court dress code, we have more options than men do, and that's fun. <laughs> it is. Uh, I was going to add, follow up with a question of how has the environment for women lawyers changed, lawyers and law professors changed over the course of your work life? The fact that we are not a tiny minority among professors or among students is an enormous change. I mean, it's very, very long since I lost count for such a long time. You would know you were one of a tiny number of uh, female law students or female faculty members and or tenured female faculty members. We're long past that. And a number of law schools, uh, certainly including New York Law School, now has a majority of female students. What has not changed nearly as much as I would have hoped is the participation of women law students in class and in extracurricular activities. And the same is true for college students. I'm on the campus lecture circuit. I speak literally at hundreds of campus talks uh, every year, and it is so dismaying to me how often uh, the audience Q&A period will include not a single female student asking a question or only a tiny minority of the questioners being females. And I've discussed this with other female faculty members. Often the students and other audience members don't even notice it. And I've talked about it with my law students and I hear various hypotheses as to why this is the case, but it seems to be a persistent pattern. And I've read some surveys that have been done about it by sociologists. And so it's not a problem on the Supreme Court. The women there really are holding their own, thank goodness, and they're great role models. But um, I wish that women would feel more outspoken. And this may go back to the point of maybe they're not as good advocates for themselves as they should be. You mentioned um, work at personal and professional balance. I'm going to use the word integrate. How did you integrate your professional and private life at different stages of your career? You mentioned that you were married, mm -hmm. so you had some private life. Uh, my, I, I feel very fortunate to have had a fabulous marriage and uh, many very, very strong friendships that I do nurture. And that's my primary uh, priority for my off-duty time. When I am, was ACLU president, many people don't realize that even though that's a more than full-time job, it is non-paying. The ACLU presidency is a volunteer position. Other organizations would use the title chair of the board. So we do have a CEO who is paid. Uh, that's the executive director who has the day-to-day hands-on responsibility, thank goodness. But I was extremely active as president and definitely put in a huge number of hours on top of being a full-time law professor during most of that time. A couple of semesters, I would just give up my salary to spend full full time on the ACLU. So during that period, uh, I, my 
personal life really took a beating. I mean, my marriage was very solid and stable. My husband was a wonderful support and my friends were very loyal. I mean, a few of them expressed hurt that I just wasn't around very much, but I missed them a lot. And um, uh, on the other hand, I did have the opportunity to nurture personal relationships with people that I would see in my travels. So as I was missing my friends in New York, I was renewing friendships uh, all over the country. Do you think your scholarship has had impact on issues affecting women? And if yes, how? I, uh, that's such an interesting question because I honestly hadn't thought about it, but very proudly I would say, Yes, uh, specifically, well, this will sound anti-intellectual, but I think most law review articles do not have very much of an impact. But I do think that the two books that I've written have had, and I believe will have an impact. Back in 1995, I wrote a book that to this day, I still get an average of one communication a week from somebody saying, I read your book in college and it really changed my life. Uh, and the book was called Defending Pornography, Free Speech, Sex, and the Fight for Women's Rights. And it actually grew out of a controversy that started here in Minnesota where uh, we're talking just about the time that I was about to depart Minneapolis for New York, uh, Catherine McKinnon and Andrea Dworkin were teaching a course at the University of Minnesota Law School and were trying to persuade the Minneapolis City Council to pass uh, what they styled a feminist anti-pornography law on the theory that uh, pornography discriminate, fostered discrimination and violence against women. Certainly, uh, I deeply oppose discrimination and violence against women. But from the get-go, I was very hesitant to sign on to a censorship agenda um, because I knew how important freedom of robust freedom of speech had been for women's rights causes, including the LGBT rights and reproductive freedom. And uh, so I started speaking and advocating on that issue and helped to form an organization called uh, Feminist for Free Expression. We didn't want to be against something, we wanted to be for it and did some testimony against um, some censorship legislation in Congress. I did write a law review article that was based on speeches and then a publisher. Pub when I became ACLU president, book publishers were calling me. The industry was very healthy then, very different from what it is now. And um, we're saying, you're ACLU president, don't you want to write a book? And I had never been interested in writing a book. And then one day, one of them called me and said, I think you should write the feminist argument, a book about the feminist argument against censoring pornography. And that again was a light bulb that went off in my head. I said, yes, I want to make that case. And I wrote the book in three months and it um, was very widely adopted in colleges and law schools. And as I say, uh, faculty members and students and others, including women, tell me that I, in particular, that I really changed their perspective on that issue. Well, that's a really interesting how your scholarship affected. Are there uh, women or people's views on issues very important to women? Do you think it made a difference in other ways that you were a female rather than a male law teacher? I have been told uh, often by not only my own law students, but in the speaking that I do constantly on the campus lecture circuit, and on, I do a lot of TV debates and interviews that um, often women will tell me that it is especially inspiring for them to see an a woman that they describe as being outspoken, I'll admit to, articulate, they tell me. And um, that's helpful as to hear because I continue to believe that too many young women are not as outspoken as I wish they would be. There's something else that I have to add here, which is I remember many years ago, I um, gave a, one of my many, many lectures was at a campus that had created a new lecture series. And 
I asked, it was a female faculty member who was the um, brains and the activism behind creating this lecture series, and I asked her what the purpose was. And she said, well, we looked at all the different speakers that were being brought in by various departments and by the university, and we saw that almost every single one of these dozens and dozens of invited speakers were men, with, were white men, with the sole exception during Black History Month, black men would be invited to come and speak about race issues. And during Women's History Month, women would be invited to come in and speak about women's issues. And so we felt it was really important to try to equalize and make it clear that women are experts on all kinds of other issues. And so I realized, because by definition, when I'm speaking on campus, I'm a woman. So I don't have the overall context, but that helped me appreciate that it probably, and I've seen some studies that have been done, that I probably am, or at least was, for many of the years of the campus lecture circuit. I don't know if things have improved or not, um, that I probably was a fairly small minority in being a woman who had expertise in non-women's issues as well as women's issues. That sort of raises the question for me of how, whether you think the views of more junior faculty, men and women, has um, changed, if at all, or how do they perceive gender issues, or, or do they perceive gender issues? We are hyper-conscious of gender issues, and I say that in a descriptive term. Um, I think it's, it's by and large positive, because as long as gender is an important aspect of identity that other people take into account, uh, we have to be conscious of it. I so wish that we would reach a point where it would be relatively irrelevant, it would be a point of interest such as are you from Minnesota or are you from Iowa, although that said, there are now more and more studies that indicate that people have so much negative or positive stereotypes associated with where you live as well. So. Uh, you know, I wish we could get beyond the essentialism of focusing on these demographic pigeonholes into which we're put, but we're not at that point, so we have to be conscious of how it affects our opportunities in, in life. I'm going to step two away just from junior faculty and, faculty and say, how has legal education in your several decades of experience with legal education, how has it um, changed or evolved since you began teaching? I, well, to start with, even before I went to law school, when I was, a, I think, a senior in college, a group of then first-year students at Harvard Law School came to my college to talk about how they had spearheaded the first course at Harvard Law School on women and the law, or gender and law. And it was one of the very first in the whole country. Now we have just a wealth of courses and course offerings and materials and scholarships that focus on uh, gender and sex and sexuality issues. So the curriculum and scholarship have become um, much richer. We're all much more concerned about diversity in our classrooms, not just in, in our staffs, um, not just in terms of um, who is in the classroom, but in being sensitive uh, in how we teach and the issues that we discuss. Um, there are some difficulties and some challenges here with all of the concerns about um, violence and sexual harassment. There are you know, reports and accounts of uh, professors, including female professors, feeling loath to teach rape law uh, for fear of, you know, and students complain that it's uh, uh, too difficult for them to grapple with these materials. That, that concerns me. As long as we have rape and sexual harassment in the real world, I want women lawyers to be prepared to be the prosecutors and the judges that, that bring justice in this area. 
You've mentioned a few of your role models along the way. Who have you left out? Your early teachers, I loved hearing about that. Teachers make a big difference in lives, but who were your special, and your parents, of course, and grandparents in their own ways? I really want to, I, first of all, I really support the Me Too movements emboldening up women to, and others to speak out against those who have exploited and abused them. But I also believe very much in positive role models and celebrating them and affirming them. So in addition to the positive female role models, I've mentioned Ruth Bader Ginsburg being you know, way up there. And I do want to say that she is so gracious and so generous. When I became ACLU president, she immediately sent me a handwritten note and always made herself available in every possible way. Uh, to this day is just exceptionally generous in providing uh, tickets to hear Supreme Court arguments to my students and always, always being a support to other women such a, and, and, and men as well. Such a, no matter how busy she is with such enormous responsibilities to uh, never be too busy to provide assistance to those who are coming after her in the profession. But I also want to salute all of the men who not only did not exploit me, but to the contrary, were so supportive at a time when men, by and large, from everything I read, did not take the trouble to treat younger women in their profession seriously or with respect or to take the time to mentor them. And one um, to whom I co and, and well there are, there are two one that I worked with more directly but I co dedicated my 2018 book on hate speech to two men uh, Norman Dorson who was my predecessor as president of the ACLU and was a professor at NYU Law School and very helpful to me in both capacities and. R.A. Nair, who was the executive director of the ACLU. Uh, both he and Norman were the leaders at the time of the Skokie case, very relevant to the topic of my book. But I also want to salute them uh, for making, and R.A. was the one who hired Ruth Bader Ginsburg for uh, the ACLU Women's Rights Project and who presided over the founding of the Women's Rights Project. He also hired Eleanor Holmes Norton uh, as one of only two national staff lawyers at the ACLU, a young African-American woman handling major Supreme Court cases. So, you know, and Norman um, befriended and mentored just uh, so many women through uh, the Hayes Civil Liberties Program that he founded and headed at NYU, just generation after generation of women who went on to have leading positions, not only in the ACLU and academia, but just the whole cross-section of human rights and civil rights organizations. You mentioned Ruth Bader Ginsburg, and it makes me think of uh, her litigation strategy for women's rights. And I want to ask if the ACLU, whether the Women's Rights Project or in general, has a litigation strategy for advancing civil rights for women in particular at this point. I honestly have not kept up with the particular strategy of the women's rights movement of our project at the ACLU, I'm so sorry to say. Uh, I used to, when I was ACLU president, mm -hmm. I kept up with the very broad agenda of the ACLU. Since 2016, I have been working more than full time on subjects related to hate speech and mm -hmm. eradicating hatred and discrimination of all kinds. And that is a full time job. I spend, even after, long after the book was finished, I still to this day spend probably an average of three hours a day reading all the developments about 
hate speech, hate crimes. There's a constant outpouring of um, social science research, um, uh, biological research, narratives of uh, members of the hate movement. I mean, literally every single day, scholarship on how do we effectively counter discrimination, which certainly includes misogynistic discrimination, but all other kinds too. So I'm so sorry, I really have not been able to keep up as much on all other aspects of the ACLU's work. Understandable. Why hate speech? Where does that come from in you? The, the, uh, I've always been passionately committed to equal rights and to free speech, and I have always believed at every stage of my activism that they're interrelated and mutually reinforcing. It started when I was in college, long before I had studied the First Amendment, but I was very involved in the anti-war movement uh, on top of the women's rights movement and reproductive freedom movement. And um, at that time, there were a lot of campus radicals who were um, protesting and silencing certain speakers who would come to campus from the military or from the government or from the defense industry. And I could not have been more anti-war. But I was also very much in favor of free speech. And among other things, even before I read John Stuart Mill, I believed and it probably had something to do with, a lot to do with my experience as a debater. I really believe that the best way to understand and to propagate the truth uh, and to explore the truth, but also to further other people's support for the truth was not through silencing, but rather through airing disagreements and through the encounter of bad ideas with, with good ideas. And um, then I revisited that debate when the ACLU controversially defended free speech for the Nazis in Skokie. That happened a couple years after I graduated from law school. I was very involved in those debates. I revisited the issue. I arrived at the same conclusion. Uh, I, uh, among other things, the ACLU's brief in the Skokie case pointed out that all the arguments that were being made to justify stopping the Nazis from marching in Skokie had been made to justify stopping Martin Luther King from uh, demonstrating from marching in Cicero, Illinois, about 10 years earlier, where the very same you know, concerns in a very different community that was highly segregated saw his speech as being divisive and hateful and dangerous and subversive and insulting and defamatory. Um, then a couple of years later, we had the movement to censor pornography on a feminist rationale. And I again revisited the issue and came to the conclusion that the best way to fight against violence and discrimination against women was through more robust free speech and that feminist speech would be the first and the greatest casualty of any censorial law, which did indeed happen. Andrea Dworkin's works were among the first that were censored by Canada when it adopted a version of her censorial law. The campus hate speech uh, code movement came along in the late 80s, early 90s. I and the ACLU again revisited our position. We again came to the conclusion that censorship, no matter how well intended, would do more harm than good. And then in the wake of Ferguson and the wonderful renewal of campus activism for uh, criminal justice and for uh, racial justice and against sexual violence and for LGBT rights and for immigrants rights. That was so wonderful. Having been a campus activist myself, I love seeing that resurgence of activism, but we started seeing too many students supporting censorship, not only for hate speech, but anything that they considered offensive. So I thought, well, maybe they've got a point. Let me just re-examine it. And I did re-examine, came to the same conclusion, and then I realized that 
I and others who supported the anti-censorship position as being the best way to promote the justice causes that these students were so wonderfully championing, we clearly had not made a sufficiently persuasive case to them. So as an advocate and as an educator wearing both of my hats, that was a wonderful challenge for me. Can I make the case more persuasively than I and others have done in the past? Your professional goals sound like they've uh, remained stable in many ways over the decades of your career. How have they, um, in fact, evolved? And what are your professional goals for yourself, not just for our society, which I think you're very articulate about, but also for you as a person? I thought you were going to ask me how my views have changed, but thank you. Because there has been some substantive evolution, I'm happy to say. Um, but in terms of personal goals, that's so in I honestly had not reflected on that before. I think that there, I know that there was a moment in my career when I was, I'm being brutally honest now, this is not putting me in a good light. I'm not proud of this. Uh, but I know there was a moment when I would have craved celebrity. Um, and not power per se, but as, and I guess it's not that embarrassing when you spend your whole life as an advocate, you want to have as big an audience as possible to advocate in front of. Uh, and so I think at a certain point in my career, if you had said, oh, you can have a TV show and you can reach a lot of people that way, I would have leapt at that opportunity because my, my general evolution was very much and has continued to be very much in moving from uh, you know, the more specific to the more general in terms of audience. And so I started as a litigator advocating for specific clients in specific cases. As an ACLU volunteer lawyer, I was advocating for broader causes to United States Supreme Court. I wrote uh, uh, quite a few friend of the court briefs for the Supreme Court for the ACLU. Then as a teacher uh, and as a spokesperson on behalf of the ACLU and a frequent lecturer on the campus lecture circuit and a frequent uh, debater and speaker on, on TV and other media, you're advocating to a broader audience. So I think at some point I put too much emphasis on just having the audience and not critically enough examining how effective is that as a way to persuade people and to bring about the social change that you want. And I know for me, the tipping point, I remember it exactly. I was on a television show that was then done by Sean Hannity together with Alan Combs. It was, they debated each other and they had would have, I think I was often the only other guest on the show and I was a regular guest on the show. And I remember one time where they were shouting and I was trying to shout and I couldn't even make my point heard. And when we got off camera, they and the producer said, that was such a great show. There was so much energy. There was so much electricity. And I thought, that's what they're aiming at. They're aiming at only the excitement, only having their faces there. And that was the very last time that I did that show and anything like it. Because I realized I'm not there to have my face on TV. Um, I'm there, and somebody said to me, oh, you have such a great Q factor. I never even had heard that term. You know, people like you. I wasn't there to get people to like me. I'm trying to persuade and educate about ideas and about principles. So that was a very significant turn, and I'm very happy. I will accept any, oh, this is dangerous, I accept any speaking engagement anywhere. For the smallest audience, I say, you know, it doesn't matter. If people are interested and have the time and the commitment, I'm so grateful to you for being willing to listen and talk. And I, and I really, it's, it is a two-way street. I've learned so much from the uh, audience members I've engaged with. 
you alluded to something that I have to come back and ask you about. Um, you said your have your legal views changed, evolved <laughs> on the hate speech issue. Uh, yes, in this sense, and it's more nuanced as one would expect, but as in, in two significant ways. As I go back over my earlier writings, I see that I allowed myself to be drawn into an oversimplified dichotomy and that we often hear about hate speech. Hate speech is not free speech, we often hear, but then we often hear the opposite, which is equally untrue. Hate speech is protected. And neither one of those generalizations is correct. And one of the things I really came to appreciate that I think is so significant and so persuasive about the wisdom of US law is that it's much more nuanced. A lot of hate speech can and should be subject to punishment, subject to quite tight constraints, but it's not an all or nothing proposition. And um, I, I, more by passively agreeing to be participate in debates about should hate speech be protected as if that's a yes or no proposition. One of the things I do now is whenever I humanly can persuade, you know, all in the powers of persuasion that I have, um, when somebody invites me to do a debate, I say, no, I really want it to be a discussion because debates, um, and I'm very good at it. I was a Minnesota state champion debater for um, two years in a row in high school. Um, and I've done many debates since then, so it's not fear of debates. But what you do then is you, you, you exaggerate the differences, right, for the theatricality of it. Uh, whereas I think to really do justice to the seriousness of this issue and how all of us care about free speech and all of us care about equality and the other countervailing concerns. And so we are seriously grappling with what's the most effective way to advance all of those concerns. I think that's done much better through a discussion format than through a debate format. Um, and, and that's also a way of modeling civil discourse uh, which with people that you disagree with strongly, which has become critically important to provide models of that in our in campus and larger communities. Um, the second change, and again, it's more an emphasis, is I really believe what in the past I, I did pay lip service and I really meant it to the harm that can be done by speech. I now really take um, pains to stress that this truly is a serious harm. Uh, at least potentially, and that it's not solely psychological and emotional, and those are important in and of, in, and of themselves, but there also are demonstrable physiological consequences. In my book, in my acknowledgments, I sincerely salute and thank the path-breaking pioneering law professors no coincidence, all of them members of racial minorities who wrote the groundbreaking articles in the 1980s through the early 1990s, um, for the first time really laying out the evidence about the harmful impact of hateful and disparaging speech. So uh, I really care much more strongly. It's not at all just an abstract um, legal concern for me. The law for me is like a tool that you can use, but it's one of many, many tools that all of us um, who are trying to create a more just society and culture have to draw upon. So I would say my evolution is um, more away from doctrinal law so that most of my reading now, I do a lot of reading in law because there's constant ferment about First Amendment and other related issues, but the vast majority of my reading is not in law at all. It's in psychology and sociology and anthropology and literature um, and neuroscience. It's, it's really fascinating because all of these fields are, we now have, sad but true, uh, uh, an interdisciplinary field of hate studies 
You know, when the law professors did their pioneering articles, Mark Twain had that famous saying, if the only tool you have is a hammer, then all problems look like nails. So it's not surprising to me that the law professors who first started exploring this issue proposed as a response to hate speech laws and codes. Now that we have these other interdisciplinary experts lending their expertise, we're coming up with a much more diverse toolbox. I'm going to ask you really two more questions. And the, the last one will be, what haven't I asked you that you want to speak about? But the second one the, to the last one is, um, if you were giving advice to a woman who was just entering or just leaving law school today, what would you tell her? I would say be very vigilant about speaking up for yourself and seeking out mentors and role models who will make it their business and priority to assist you and to encourage you uh, to speak up for yourself, to develop all of your skills and opportunities to your fullest potential, and who will give you the opportunities that will call out of you your highest potential. Um, how do you find those? How do you find those? Um, you can do it through word of mouth. Let me tell you, I have... <sighs> Let me just tell you an anecdote. Um, a week ago, I had the great honor of giving the keynote address at the annual banquet of the Harvard Law Review. And that's a fairly big deal, I discovered. The very first woman to ever give that very coveted uh, talk was Gloria Steinem. And she did it in 1974. Um, so, uh, anyway, uh, uh, it turns out that the Harvard Law Review now has, it didn't when I was a student, but um, they have something called interns, which turn out to be college students who are doing some legal research for them. As, and so this was a huge banquet hall packed with you know hundreds of alums and professors and, and students. And I think many students were very shy to talk to me. You know, they were, I could see by their kind of hesitancy to approach, but one who came right up to me, and you could see she was fighting a little bit of anxiety, turned out to be an undergraduate, I think only a, a sophomore in college, and she had the guts to approach me and she asked some excellent questions. She then took the initiative to send me an email afterwards and she said you know i'm doing this research for the harvard law review if you ever if i'm so support your work if you can ever use my assistance in any way of course i immediately leapt at the opportunity not so much because she's going to provide assistance to me that i can't get from a zillion other law students and i don't mean to disparage it because that was so outstanding that she showed that initiative that i knew this is a young woman who is going to be a dynamite advocate for liberty and justice and any other good cause that she chooses to pursue because she's taking that initiative. And you know, this has happened, I can't tell you how many times, whenever somebody takes that initiative, I always, always respond positively. And I know so many other faculty members who do, and we've compared notes, you know, on the one hand, is it unfair because we're not sending out a general announcement, apply if you want to be my research assistant? No, because that is a relevant characteristic. To me, that is infinitely more relevant than what their law school or college transcript is going to show, right? It demonstrates the very qualities that you want in somebody who wants to be a crusader for justice. So never hesitate to take that initiative. It's possible that somebody could be off put, but if they are, that's not the sort of person that is going to be helpful to you anyway. That's wonderful advice. So you've been speaking for quite some time and all afternoon as it is. Um, is there any 
anything you wish I had asked about or anything else you would like to talk about, and then we can bring this to a wrap. No, thank you so much. <laughs>